one message you should take away from the, the 60 seconds that I'll have to talk about Columbia is, is that Columbia University has probably the broadest sweep of climate scientists addressing uh, the workings of planet Earth of any university uh, in this country. Uh, we have atmospheric scientists like Adam, from whom you're going to hear in a few minutes. We have oceanographers. We have ecologists. We have climate modelers. We have experts in polar processes. We have uh, experts like Peter Domenical, who's in this audience and should raise his hand, uh, who's an expert on, on the climate of the past, uh, on the way the oceans worked in the past. Uh, the e experts read into uh, corals and ice and tree rings and the rocks and sediments left behind by glaciers, the, the history of, of uh, climate on this planet. And that history becomes a testbed for models of climate change run on the best computers and used to predict future outcomes. Of course, uh, climate scientists at Columbia interact through the Earth Institute with all of those working at Columbia on impacts of climate in agriculture and sustainability, in coastal processes, in urban planning, in economics and law. It is indeed a very broad sweep. Uh, you're going to hear uh, from my colleague Art Lerner Lamb at another one of these events on climate and risk. You're going to hear from Peter Domenical at the third of these events. Uh, so sit back and enjoy, but know that Columbia University is at the forefront of climate science. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Sean. And it is now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Adam Sobel, Director and Chief Scientist for Columbia University's Initiative on Extreme Weather and Climate. He's the author of Storm Surge, Hurricane Sandy, Our Warming Planet, and the Extreme Weather of Past and Future. And Robert Sullivan, writer and journalist, author of The Meadowlands, Wilderness Adventures at the Edge of a City. This is going to be a conversation to start, but we also hope to have very open dialogue, so save your questions for the end. Thank you. I'm Bob, Adam, because many people probably know Adam. Probably no one knows me. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, maybe going to ask him some questions, because if you've read his, his book about the hurricane, uh, I, think, I think you got good advice from an ecologist, right? Or a high, an ecologist? For my wife, you mean? That's your right, your wife. <laughs> Who's, who said what? Right, so at the time, so this is a story that is in the book. So at the time when I uh, decided that I was gonna give up on being a musician and try to be a scientist, I was gonna try to decide what kind of scientist to be. And um, I studied physics in college and my uh, wife who, um, we weren't married yet, but same woman. And she uh, was an environmentalist from the very beginning. And she said, well, if I had a physics background, this was about 1991, if I had a physics background like you, I'd study uh, meteorology and global warming. And I said, no, that's boring. Uh, didn't, didn't interest me at the time. But I thought about it and you know, eventually got interested in meteorology. And that's what I did. So she was, was right. Bob believes you should always listen to your wife. That's, uh, uh, I believe you should always listen to your <laughs> wife. And uh, sort of w w what if, I mean, for people who are not uh, atmospheric scientists, uh, what, what is the kind of latest, you know, what's sort of the headline news in, in thinking about um, extreme weather? I mean, and we were talking before, I mean, obviously all kinds of extreme weather. I mean, it's a huge question, but. Right. So the, just to start with the basics, so the, the planet is getting warmer because of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases that humans have emitted. And as a consequence of that, uh, the weather is changing in a number of ways. Extreme events, by definition, are rare events. So they're things that don't happen very often. That's what makes them extreme. And um, so by nature, it's, it's hard to associate those with, with climate as a scientific problem because an extreme event, climate is, is averages. Climate is, by definition, the average of the weather. So you need a lot of weather events to make a good stable average. And so if an extreme only happens once in a while, it's hard to associate. So that's, they always say we climate scientists bury the lead. I just did that. Mm -hmm. but, um, it depends what kind of extreme event you're talking about. So, so there are some events which are fairly easy to understand how they're related to the change in climate. The simplest is a heat wave. A heat wave is when it gets very hot for a long period of time. And what you would think would happen in a warming climate is that a heat wave would be more frequent or more severe. And that is, in fact, exactly what we think is happening uh, already. 
and it's going to happen more as the climate warms further. So it's, it's almost as simple as you would think it would be. It's not quite that simple, but it almost is. And then different kinds of events um, become more and more complicated. So droughts uh, in places which are already drought prone, like the southwest US, like the California, we expect the, our models tell us, and we have some understanding of why they tell us this, which increases our confidence, that those places are going to see more and more severe droughts. You may have seen the work of some of my colleagues from Lamont recently attributing uh, the war in Syria, uh, in part to the drought there, which in part is related to the changing climate. Um, the one in California right now we think is probably mostly natural, but over the long term, uh, the southwest US in general is going to see uh, hotter and drier conditions as a consequence of the circulation patterns changing and the heat evaporating the, the water more quickly once it reaches the ground. Um, Floods, uh, heavy rainfall gets heavier because there's more water vapor in the air in a warmer climate. Hurricanes are getting more complicated. Uh, the relation between a hurricane and the climate in which it occurs is a, is a complex problem. Uh, it's not just as simple as a warmer ocean making a stronger hurricane, which we used to think was the case because hurricanes like warm oceans. Um, so, But you were saying there were some extreme events that there's very little understanding. Yes, so for example, tornadoes, we know very little about whether tornadoes are going to be more or fewer in the future or, or stronger or weaker. We have some ideas about it, but it's really just in its infancy. In, in all cases, though, um, what we can say with the most confidence, which sometimes isn't a lot, or sometimes it's less, or sometimes it's more, depending what kind of event, but what we can say with the most confidence is as the climate warms, we expect uh, more or fewer of some type of event over a large region over a long period of time, or we expect them to get more severe. What's very difficult is to, and what the media always wants us to do, is to say, this event that just, Hurricane Sandy, yeah. was it caused by global warming or not? Yeah. That, that it's not impossible right. to, to make probabilistic statements well, about that. that. So, um, so is a lot of that a matter of, I mean, give us more uh, time and, and, you know, help us model more? Is this more, is that part of what, you know, in, the, in those question marks, can we, if we just model more? Right. It's, it, it's, it's not like it's just model more. Question. It's, it's, it's not a fashion question. Modeling more. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's not just model more. It's everything. So our science, the first thing you have to understand about all Earth, not all Earth science, but most Earth science, and certainly climate science, is that it's not a laboratory science. So we don't have experiments. Well, we don't have controlled experiments. Anymore. We're doing an uncontrolled one on the planet, but you only get to do it once. I mean, we can't, we can't make a, a, a copy of the atmosphere or the ocean in a lab that behaves like the real one and poke it and see what happens. So what we have to do, our only experiments, our only controlled experiments are on the computer where we simulate the behavior in, um, in models which are basically computer programs that are very, very complex mimics of the real climate system. Yeah. But those are only as, you know, the experiments are only as good as the models. These are simulations, they're not the real thing. So we have to, of course, sup, you know, combine that with actually observing the real system. Right. Even though it's not experiment. I mean, we, all we can do is observe what the climate is doing today. We can't change it. We can't see what if it were, you know, what if something were different? What if the sun were further right. away or the earth were spinning faster? We can only observe. But we, so we do observations. We do them from far away, from space. We do them close up by being on the ground or being in planes. And then we combine that with models to try to synthesize all the information and make inferences using, you know, s complex combinations of those things. Right. Um, and yes, so, so we, we need to, Keep doing that. That's why we're all here. But I think it, where you're going was, is is a, is a big thing. So so um, you know just kind of a, something that the average person at home wonders about. Uh, after Sandy, uh, the question is, was it was it climate change, or was it not climate change? So I mean, you, I've heard you. I mean, you've talked a lot about this. Right. So and you need to talk more about it right now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, so Sandy was. Um, there's general statements we can make about hurricanes. We think they're getting stronger. We're pretty sure they're getting stronger. Um, whether there's more or fewer, the, the models are still somewhat disagreeing about. More likely to be fewer but stronger. That's the latest. But Sandy, that doesn't tell us much about Sandy because it was just one storm, and it's always hard to say anything about one storm in its relation to climate. Second of all, it was a very unusual storm. It was the biggest Atlantic hurricane on record since we have data on how big they are, which is basically since we have satellites about Know, a few decades, um, it was. It made a had an unprecedented track. It made this left turn that you've all 
probably seen in the, in, uh, at one time or another. And all of that was a consequence of this transition it was making from being a, tr a true hurricane to an extratropical or winter type of storm that was, you know, wasn't technically a hurricane at landfall, even though it just was just as destructive as if, as if it had been. And so um, it's sort of outside the parameters of, there's a lot of studies of how hurricanes are related to climate, and Sandy is sort of outside the parameters of many of those studies. So we can't, it's a long, complicated way of saying we can't make any strong statements based on the science we have today right. about how Sandy, the storm, is related to climate change. What we can say uh, is that coastal flooding disasters like Sandy uh, produced are becoming uh, more probable right. as the climate warms because of sea level rise. Right. So the sea levels are rising. It's risen about a foot in New York since about 100 years ago. About two-thirds of that is due to climate warming. The other foot is due to the other few inches is due to the land sinking, which is natural. It's a rebound from the last ice age. But so that, you know, six or eight inches, I can't remember the exact number, is added that much to Sandy's flood. There's an estimate, by the way, recently a paper study estimated that that added $2 billion to the damage, which is a small fraction of the total, but still huh. significant. But the projections are for as much as a meter or more of sea level rise globally by the end of the century. So uh, that's about three feet. So if we have, so that's quite within the realm of possibility. So if we have three feet of sea level rise, Sandy's storm surge was nine feet. That's the, the, how high the water was, how much higher the water was because of the storm over where it would have been. So three feet is a third of that. And so a nine foot storm surge is like a one in a couple hundred year event, but a six foot storm is much more common. So we, so you add three feet and you're gonna get a lot more floods like that. So that, I think that's the simple part of the story. Right, right. Sea level rise is really the big, for a coastal city like New York, that's the big elephant. But this that, is, that and heat. Right, uh, heat, right. The, the, so, but to, um, when Sandy happened, you, you, I mean, you were, uh, you, you, one of the things, if I ask you where you were when Sandy happened, you were kind of um, either I was hearing you on WNYC or I think on, on PBS. I mean, I, I think you were on my, you know, my local cable. You know, you were, you were many places. It was very exciting. I'm like, I know that guy. He's talking about. And, um, and it, was like, it was like fighting a storm. I mean, for you, like the kind of, dis, not disinformation, but people want to know one thing and you're trying to tell them something. And, you know, I want to ask you where you were during Sandy, even though you broke rules. You did what you weren't supposed to do. You, you, you went outside. They told everybody to stay inside and you went down to the river. But, um, but I, I want to ask you, you know, kind of where you were, but, but also um, what it was like kind of dealing with the storm of, of questions. Um, at the time of Sandy, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it made me think differently about the role of a, of a working scientist. Um, so I was here, uh, you know, I, I've been studying hurricanes with colleagues at Lamont for, for a decade and a half and, well, a dozen years at that time. And, um, but not focusing on individual weather events. I'm not a forecaster. We don't really have weather forecasters at Lamont. It's one of the few things we don't have. Um, Sean mentioned we have just about everything else. But I've become interested in, in weather events, you know, in, in the local weather more and more over the years. And we'd had Irene the year before, which was very exciting for me, even though it didn't, wasn't so destructive in the city in the end. But then Sandy comes and what happened is I just started getting phone calls. I mean, it never had happened to me before. We have some scientists who talk to the media all the time. I really hadn't done it, um, hardly at all. But I, you know, they wanted a hurricane scientist in New York. There aren't very many. So um, I started getting calls and it just sort of snowballed. And, um, I actually didn't think there was disinformation. I, I felt a lot of the local media coverage was very good. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to. No, no, but it's important to say because, I mean, some, with some science stories are, are, you know, not handled well. But this one, I, I felt we had a good, well-educated local media. Yep. In part, that was because the city has been taking climate seriously for a long time. I'm a, and I'm a big Janice Huff fan, so you can't say anything against Janice Huff. I, I love her, <laughs> so be careful. But go ahead, yeah. Anyway, so... You know, I just found myself in this position, and, and um, along with many of us, I mean, many local scientists, some, a couple, couple who were in this room, I, I saw Philip Horton, I think, here before, who was a uh, Lamont graduate, who was speaking to the media a lot also at that time about, about the storm surge. And um, I found, you know, so it became, it's become sort of a sideline second career for me in the last couple of years, as I found that I'm comfortable doing this, and once they know who you are, they keep calling you. Uh, so I've been talking about extreme weather events a lot, and I, I felt at first a little bit strange about it. Uh, first of all, a little survivor guilt, because this huge disaster was sort of good for my career in some way, but I've gotten over that, I think. But the other um, thing is that it, it, you know, it's not what we think we're paid for. We're paid for doing research, 
and advancing the frontiers of knowledge and not explaining it to the public. But, right, but uh, I found the university very supportive, though. Uh, so so it, it does feel but like I mean, part of my the, job these now. Are, do we, I, I hate that phrase, teaching moment. I just hate that phrase so much. I hate when parents use it. Oh, my God. I hate, I'm a parent. I hate it so much. But I mean, this is, a, this is, a, I mean, this is when people are listening. I mean, we were talking about, um, uh, we were talking about we, the, the study, how, uh, what was the, what was the um, phrase that was so great um, about uh, people understanding things in certain time frames? Um, availability? Yes. Right. Give me that again. Availability bias. We were yeah. talking about the availability bias. So, I, right. I Should we explain this. that? Go ahead. So uh, the, the thing about, I mean, so there's a psychologist. Uh, so this is a, this is a, 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 this is about how people think about risks. And I think it's relevant to uh, climate change. And it's a, a lesson that Sandy has to teach us about how we think about climate change that's independent of the actual physical or atmospheric relation between the two. But it's a psychological relation between the two. So Daniel Kahneman is this uh, Nobel Prize winning psychologist. He wrote this book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, many of you may have read it. And it's about, the, the as the title says, the two ways people have of thinking. So we think fast when we're dealing with something that's familiar to us that we've experienced many times. We don't really have to process it at an intellectual level, and we just react. And that usually works if we're dealing with something that's familiar. Uh, but then if we're dealing with something that's unfamiliar, and we're given scientific information about it, and we have to run numbers in our head, we have to calculate odds, or you know, then we're not good at that, at making decisions based on that kind of information. So even, even professional statisticians aren't good at it. The psychologists have, have shown this. So, but once something, so if something's never happened to you, and you're only told by a scientist that it could happen, then you sort of don't take it seriously. And that was the case with Sandy. So it was known for decades that there could be uh, a hurricane that could hit New York that could be worse than any had been in the past. And if that happened, that the subways would flood. I mean, scientists at Columbia had shown that very clearly, as well as others even, even earlier. Um, you know, that a lot of infrastructure would, would be destroyed, that low-lying neighborhoods would, would be wrecked. All these consequences were, were known, but the Nothing was really done about it. I mean, we have a, a and then we have a very responsive, we had and, and still have a very responsive, competent, scientifically literate local government that did most of the right things in the moment of the hurricane, evacuating people and closing the system, saving lives and property, but the infrastructure wasn't prepared because that took long-term investment. And even with predictions that were made about the need for investment in a more resilient infrastructure, it didn't happen. And that's because nobody had been through an experience like Sandy, and so it didn't, it was hard to, it was using the slow way of thinking and, and we, don't make, we don't do that well. So then the Sandy happens, and now everybody thinks it's the new normal, and we're in a different world. But the problem with, uh, and so that's the availability bias is once something happens to you, then it's available, and you start, you use the fast way of thinking, and you tend to overestimate the likelihood it's going to happen again. Right. But where were you on the night of Sandy? Where did you go? Where, well, I was, uh, so I was home yeah. talking to reporters, and then... Uh, I just want to stress, and what were the... What were the what, they were telling us not to go outside. They were telling us not to go outside, but I went outside in the end because I yeah. wanted to see the river flooding and, the and land. And by it? the way, it was the, the water where I went, so where you can easily get to the river from where we, from the Columbia neighborhood where I live, is, is down by Fair, Uptown Fairway, if you know, the area about 12th Avenue and about 133rd. And the river was almost up onto 12th Avenue. And that's, by the way, where Columbia is building its new campus. So the water did not yeah. get onto the construction site, so the yeah. new campus would not have flooded in Sandy, but almost. Yeah. So it's, you know, I mean, the thing about, about natural disasters is that they make, you know, in this dense urban environment where it's easy to feel that we're not a part of nature at all, it, nature intrudes in a very uh, big way, and we right. are forced to remember it. So the places that flooded in Sandy were all the places that, you know, those who study such things knew would flood. I right. mean, they're all the low-lying places. They were all wetland, right. uh, barrier island like the Rockaways, or landfill like, like just along the river south of here, um, along the harbor and south they tend of here. To be places where there's uh, they're all low places. Yeah, low places. Pu public housing built on those places. In some cases, yeah. Yeah, and so the Sandy also stressed kind of income inequality in the city, um, for, and we had like in the Red Hook housing down the block from me, you know the heat, the heat, the you know heating uh, units are still suffering from Sandy. I mean, the, it 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 kind of jolts the city and, and shows what's right and wrong about it in a lot of different ways. Right. I guess the point I, I was thinking of is just that, you know, that 
all these places are now built on, which maybe 100 or more years ago wouldn't have been yet, but the real estate's become so valuable, the city sort of develops to some extent in, in defiance or maybe partially in ignorance of, of the topography, right. very literally of the, of the strategy, the properties of the landscape. Yeah. But then we become aware of it again, you know, in a disaster. And I think just getting back to the thinking fast and slow, you know, the problem with climate change is that things are going to happen that haven't happened to us before. Right. And, and the science is telling us that. Science is telling us what's going to happen with some uncertainty, but with some certainty as well. And, you know, the challenge is for human, as for human beings is to learn how to not just be reactive. Right. Because being reactive is a really bad strategy. Right. Is to be proactive, and we're not good at that. Thank you very much for a really interesting uh, interchange. Um, and um, I wanted to um, bring up a point that you mentioned at the very beginning, Adam, about how um, the climate is kind of challenging the traditional way that science is done because we can't do the experiments again and again to prove something. I wondered whether you think uh, this will actually change how science is done or if you think it should. Uh, is, is this a question that's being asked in the scientific community? Well, I wouldn't, I mean, there have always been what I would call observational sciences. I mean, sciences that, that couldn't do controlled laboratory experiments. So all earth sciences, more or less, are like this. Astronomy, for, for one thing, is like this. Um, there are probably others that I'm not thinking of. But you know, la there are some areas of physics and chemistry and biology where you have lab experiments. We don't. So I, I don't think that in and of itself is new. I think what's new in climate science, and, in some, and increasingly in other sciences, too, is the role of computer simulation, which wasn't historically available, and which meteorologists in, really invented. It's the first, I mean, the first time anything was predicted by a mathematical model using laws of nature is really weather forecasting. And it's, so we've tested that over many years, and climate science is built on that, on that success. Um, I think it's, it's still almost unique in that way. There are very few things that are predicted. Almost all other forms of prediction that we can think of, like economic models, you know, models that are used to predict the stock market, um, you know, the models people use to predict sports. I mean, if you read Nate Silver, these are all statistical models. They're basing future uh, returns on past performance in some way, whereas climate models and weather models are not that. They're the laws of physics solved mathematically on a computer. Now that's also done in, in, in that's being done in all areas of science. So I would say so it is, computer simulation is changing how science is done. Some people call it a third mode of investigation. There's experiment and theory. Those are the two traditional I mean, philosophers or philosophers of science have written for a long time about how experiments and theory are different or the same and how they work with each other. So simulation is somewhere in between. And uh, sometimes you shouldn't trust a simulation. Sometimes maybe you can. How do you know the difference? Um, all simulations are not created equal. Some models are very faithful to the thing they're simulating. Some are not. Some are some are you know, really vividly realistic, and some are not. Um, we have ways of telling, but it's a, I think it is, uh, it is changing the way we do science. I think what's different about climate from anything else is that we're making a prediction, and we won't be able to prove, well, I shouldn't say that, because some people have pointed out that climate scientists have been making predictions about climate change since the 70s, and, a, and most of those predictions have come true. So it, when you hear that you know, we can't test our predictions, that's not quite true. But they take a long time to come true. So predictions being made now for 2100 or beyond, you know, unlike weather forecasting, where we know every day how good we did, you know, those we won't know for a long time. And so um, we're asking, we're, you know, we're, we're telling the world that we have some idea of what's happening. Um, and it's not only based on computer simulation by any means. We know a lot of that we have many other sources of knowledge about the climate besides computer simulation. We have what happened in the past. We have our knowledge of the basic physics. We have observations. But nonetheless, our predictions of the future do involve computer simulation to some extent. So we really are, it really is a different, it's a computer simulation that unlike weather forecasting, you're going to have to wait till it's too late to really see with your own eyes that it's true. So it, it is a, a challenging situation. And just the time involved is challenging. That's what I guess I was trying to get at with the availability bias before. It's hard to get people to do something when you're telling them something about something they've never experienced that's far in the future. 
even if people believe, even if the person believes you, it's hard to for them to take action based on that. I just want to follow up on that. So there are so many unknowns, and the time scale is so long, but there's also a sense of urgency around decisions that we have to make, policy and other decisions. So how, how do you do that when there are so many unknowns, and how do we make sure that the best scientific thinking informs the policies and decisions that people make? Right. So, I, I mean, I think what we have to do, and of course, you know, I have to say as a representative of the university, you know, that, I mean, we have to keep working to make the science better. I think that goes without saying. Um, but at the same time, I think we, ha we have to know what, not just what we know and what we don't know, but the different degrees to which we know and don't know things, and make the decisions that are based on the the best knowledge that we have. We don't, we're not going to take radical steps based on the most uncertain predictions. But right now, when it comes to uh, climate change, we're so far from doing the things we need to do that even though the uncertainties are very serious, there's no chance that we're overreacting. So until there is a chance that we're overreacting, you know, we really don't have to worry about that. I mean, and I think and that's when it comes to mitigation. So when it comes to reducing, mitigation is the word we use in the climate community for emitting less greenhouse gases. That's, that's the proactive thing we can do to slow climate change. We can't stop it because some is already, we're already committed to some because the carbon we've already emitted is taking a while to, for its warming to play out. But we can slow it by emitting less carbon. And that, um, we know enough about the climate system to know that we should be taking stronger action there. And, and that really, Everybody but the most anti-science, you know, people who are un totally unresponsive to evidence, everybody can agree on that. What we can't agree on is who should do what about it. But, you know, when it comes to adaptation, which means dealing with the climate change that's already happened or that we know is going to happen, uh, the uncertainties also only become a problem after a point. Because in many ways, we're not adapted to the climate that we already have. So the California drought is a perfect example of this. The, um, the wa even if there were no climate change, California should have a more rational water system. Um, they would be drought prone anyway. Similarly with New York City, Sandy could have happened without climate change. Eight, eight inches of sea level rise, you know, maybe that's $2 billion, but that leaves another $58 billion that we would have had anyway. And so, you know, we knew the city was vulnerable. We built in all these low-lying places. We should decide not to do some of those things anyway. Now, there will come a point, some of the measures the city's taking now, I mean, the city's doing a lot of things now uh, to adapt. Um, but Bloomberg said in his last days, and de Blasio is keeping up this policy, we won't, won't retreat from the waterfront. Well, someday we may have to retreat from the waterfront after enough sea level rise. But, so there will become a point at which the, the uncertainties in the climate change projection will be really consequential for knowing what actions to take. But in many cases, we haven't reached that point yet. So that I think the, the, our knowledge of the science, both of climate change and of all the other ways that the way we're living is not sustainable, which would be there anyway, you know, we, we, there are many what we call no regrets measures when it comes to adaptation. And so I think I, there, you know, there's a lot we don't know and, we, and there's a lot of decisions that would, could be better informed if, you know, the science were a little bit better, and so there's a lot of mileage to be gained in, in the work that we do. But at the same time, for policy, I think, in many cases, our scientific knowledge is actually not the limiting factor. The limiting factor is politics and economics, and the science is good enough, in many cases, if we would listen to it, to tell us what to do. We were talking about the sanitary crisis, you know, in the 1830s, 40s, cholera. I mean, the good. cities yes. were just, you know, was, things were not going well in the city, cities, and is it Edwin Chadwick who, who invents the kind of, you know, safety drain and um, that'll break up s flows and sewerage? That's a revolutionary change that comes to America. We change the way cities are, are, you know, the way water comes in and fluids go out. We change that in a matter of 50 years. I mean, long time, pretty quick. I mean, we completely redo how we do cities. So I know it's a smaller, smaller footprint, fewer people, but um, pretty vast change. Okay, 
Uh, thank you so much for um, the lecture. And I, my question is that, so is there any way for uh, like normal people to understand climate change risk without doing like complicated modeling? Um, well, <laughs> what particularly about, about it do you want to understand? I mean, some, some things are simple, right? I mean, so uh, you, and I don't, I don't think most people should do climate change modeling. It's not, it's not, um, it's not uh, you know, going to be a good investment of most people's time. But, but I, I mean, is there some particular question that? Yeah, uh, so like, do you think it's, it matters for like average people to understand how like this risk is going to affect our like business operation or that kind of things? And how do we get to know that if we don't know that much about like climate modeling? Well, I don't think, you know, I don't think it's necessary for everyone to understand everything about climate modeling, right? I mean, the, the modern world depends in untold ways on science done by other people, and we can never understand, even those of us who are professional scientists, we only know our little bit. I mean, I don't under, really understand how a cell phone works in, in detail, right? I don't know, I don't even really know how, I mean, I don't really, can't even fix a car, right? So. So we, we, we all have to have some degree of, of faith in the details. I mean, we, we can't expect to understand all the details of any science, even stuff that's pretty close to what we actually do if we're scientists. So I think, you know, there is a question about whether scientists are communicating the risks well enough. I mean, whether we're translating scientific knowledge into human consequences and whether we're explaining those consequences well enough I think we can always do better at that, um, and uh, you know I, I do think that people, you know, there's an interest in it. Um, I think, by the way, that one one way that people understand these things is through stories, and one of the same things that makes it hard to take action about climate change projections, which is that it's far in the future, is what makes it hard to tell even fictional stories about climate change. So I don't know if you, um, this is getting into psychology again, sorry, is that okay, Jerry? Yes. yes. So that if you saw The Day After Tomorrow, so The Day After Tomorrow is a climate change movie where the whole world freezes over, and it's based on a realistic, a, a real scenario from real climate science where it's thought that in past ice ages, as you're coming out of an ice age, the ice melts, and through a complicated series of, of uh, actions in the, involving the ocean circulation, as the ice melting, because it's getting warmer, it actually shuts down the ocean circulation and it freezes again, the planet freezes again very quickly. But quickly means decades or maybe a century. That's quick in geologic time. But in the day after tomorrow, that happens in like two days. Or even faster, you see the like wave of ice, you know, moving across the planet. So it's totally unrealistic, took a realistic thing and made it totally unrealistic. Um, I mean, it's also unrealistic because that's not going to happen now anyway. I mean, the planet's just getting hotter, it's not going to freeze. But, but it happened way too fast, and the reason they did that was because nobody has 50 years to wait in a movie, right? You, it's a movie, and, and the guy has to go save his kids, and he has to grow as a person, and, you know. So I think th the fact that the movie makers felt the need to do that, they needed to speed it up and make it more immediate, tells us something about the, the problem we face as science communicators. Uh, that I think we're talking about something that's very big, it's global, it takes a long time. Uh, maybe we've just come out of one of the worst winters we've had in a long time. I'm sorry, I didn't understand I'm, I'm, what you just said. We've just come out of a really tough winter, oh, with yes. low temperatures and record. So for the skeptics, it's very easy to argue that, you know, something, something is not really right with the predictions. And I think something useful would be to explain to people why it's now not called global warming, it's called climate change, and why things are more erratic and less predictable, and it's just manifest itself in different ways. So I'm actually okay with global warming. I think global warming is still a fine name for what's happened. I mean, obviously, it doesn't capture the whole story, but no two words will. Um, if you look, first of all, 2014 globally was the warmest year in the history of the records. If you look at the map of the temperature difference relative to the historical average for the last winter, you see a blue spot over the northeast US, and everything else is red. Everywhere else was warm. The west was hot like crazy, right? It was super hot and dry. There's no snow in the mountains. 
but not only the West. I mean, everywhere else in the, in the hemisphere was warm all winter, um, and the Southern Hemisphere too, for that matter, where it was summer. So, I mean, the, the, actually, you could say the skeptics have an easier time arguing that this says some, is somehow contradicting the statements about global warming, but it really doesn't. I mean, that's a, it's an extremely shallow criticism, right? It's like Senator Snowball. I mean, it's, it's, it's such a vacuous um, argument as, as to be that easily refuted, I think. But there is a more serious question, which I don't know if it's the one you meant to. There are a couple more serious questions. The first is that the last uh, 10 or 15 years, the planet has been, uh, has not gotten warmer over that significantly warmer over that period, although that period was warmer than the 10 years before that was warmer than the 10 years before that. So I mean, the long-term trend has continued going up. And the other sort of maybe much more subtle and complex question that many of us are really working hard on, there is an argument that some are, are making that these last uh, two winters in the Northeast, which were both quite cold, are actually sort of counterintuitively a result of the warming climate because the jet stream is disturbed in such a way that even though it's warmer everywhere, it's still colder over the North Pole and Canada than here, and that air is coming in our direction more than it otherwise would because the jet stream is distorted. Um, that's a very subtle question. I, I'm not, I should just, I'm not convinced by that research. I don't think that's that likely to be true. I think it's more likely that we had two fluky cold winters in a row and over the long term, our winters are going to keep getting warmer, just as, as they have over the last um, century. Uh, but um, and you know, there were winters earlier in the century that earlier in the previous century, I should say, that were much colder than the all the all the coldest years in the record. Most of them are 100 years ago or more. I mean, it really used to be colder, and I think that trend is going to continue. And I, I'm not too convinced about this jet stream stuff. But there are a lot of unanswered questions there, and I'm not completely certain of that. Um, so I think these, one thing we, the things we know the most about climate change are the things that are thermodynamic, which means things that have a lot to do with temperature. So the fact that a warmer atmosphere has more water vapor in it is very hard to get out of. I mean, it's not true everywhere, but globally it's true. And uh, on average, and that's going to make heavier rainstorms and probably stronger hurricanes and other things. And so that's one of the things we know the best. But how the circulation, how the wind patterns change is one of the more subtle things. And some things our simulation models tell us very robustly about that. Other things they don't agree on. Even when they do tell us something's going to happen, we're not always sure why. These long-lived patterns where the atmosphere locks in, you know, it wasn't just cold. It was cold day after day after day after day. And this distorted jet stream just stayed there. And why does it go into those patterns and stay there for so long sometimes? And is there anything predictable about that? Does it have anything to do with, you know, is there a forced signal, which means is it due to human, you know, greenhouse gases? All those things, I think, are open research questions still that we're, many of us, Columbia, are working on.